Well, good morning. Good morning to the brave. I'd like to begin this morning by reminding us of the story of St. Paul, who traveled around the Mediterranean spreading the story of the risen Christ in the first century or so following the crucifixion. There would have been long stretches of time between his visits to each community in which he planted a church. And he wanted people to know that he would pray for them. And he wanted them to pray for him, even when they couldn't see one another in person. I've been thinking about that in this time when, as a community of faith, we don't get to see one another in person very often. So I'd like to offer these words of St. Paul, which maybe will help us to stay connected, even as we are increasingly apart from one another in the months to come. This could be our daily prayer for one another. St. Paul said to the people of Ephesus, may the eyes of your heart be enlightened. May the eyes of your heart be enlightened. Let us pray. Loving and insistent and persistent, God, we gather once again in your name this day. We gather to find the strength we need from one another, but knowing that the best of all our strengths come from you. Be with us in this hour of prayer and contemplation, we pray. Still our anxious minds and help us to find here a peace that passes all understanding and enable us to take that peace home with us when we depart. In these times of turmoil and anxiety, we ask that you would help us to strengthen the eyes of our hearts so that we could see the whole world with eyes of loving compassion and grace. When there are those around us who sow distrust, let us be purveyors of accord. When there are those around us who speak of hate, let us speak the healing word of love. When those around us see the world through eyes laden with fear, let us show through our manner and our words that we know ultimately all manner of things shall be well. Help us all to be living testimonies to our faith in you. And as the days pass, help us to pray for one another to picture the faces of those whose fellowship we rely upon in this community of faith. We ask this in all our prayers in the name of Jesus the Christ, who taught his disciples to pray together, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> Well, 
shout out over the water I won't be here long Well, my soul is anchored in Jesus Now in the world and heaven do me no harm by the great blues and gospel singer Reverend Gary Davis Light of this world I always ended out with a, making it a medley with another song that was a song that I learned from my 5th grade music teacher in Belfont, Pennsylvania every year she had us she used to make us come up to the front of the room at the beginning of the year and stand there and sing all alone in front of the class. I don't know why she did it, I guess to build our confidence or maybe to find out where our voices were for the year, I don't know. But anyway, this was a song that she always had us, had us sing. All night, all day, angels watching over me. terrorized a few kids to have to stand there and sing. <laughs> well, good morning once again. This is actually our ninth outdoor worship service. You have been brave and it's been wonderful to see you in person, those of you who've been able to join us. As the weather gets colder and the cases increase in the coming months, as it coming weeks, as it is predicted too, it grows likely that we might have to move indoors. That would mean that we would record in the meeting house on Saturdays, and you would receive that recording in time to go to church at home on Sunday morning. But I know there are a number of us who are hoping we can stay outdoors as long as possible. 
Please stay tuned or call the church office number if you have a question. It's always been hard to predict the weather, but now we have the added task of predicting the track of the virus. We will make our decisions thoughtfully and carefully, and we'll try to do so with as much advance notice as possible. This afternoon at 5 o'clock, our adult forum committee will offer a session with the director of the Roger Tory Peterson Center, Alicia Millardo. The link for joining that Zoom presentation is on our church website or available from Laura. Before that, at 4 o'clock, there will be a gathering the Social Justice Network in front of the Essex Town Hall. All are always welcome. Moving along, the walking group will meet at 8.30 this Wednesday in front of the Sheffield Auditorium, and Laura will host a minister drop-in on Wednesday morning from 10 to 12, outside if the weather's nice, or inside the Sheffield Auditorium if being outside is not possible. Our Sunday school met today on Zoom at 9.30, and they be we believe they will continue to do so as far as we now predict, 9.30 on Sunday mornings. Lisa Doggart stays in touch with our Sunday School families with weekly updates and plans. So those of you who have children, watch your emails. And here is one very special announcement. Brian Cheney will appear on a special broadcast from Carnegie Hall this coming Thursday. He will sing a piece from a remarkable opera that tells the story of the friendship between Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Justice Antonin Scalia. We will post information for that link on our church's website, or free, feel free to call me and I'll help you if I can. I'm not great with this technology, but I'll help if I can. The song is a duet between the two justices, and it's entitled, We Are Different, We Are One. You can't get more appropriate than that right now. Please check the church website for all details about our programs or call the church office. Or as I've said before, please know you can call me or Laura or Steve at any time. We're grateful to all those who've made the service possible this morning. Our technology team is stellar. So thanks to Odile Brennan, John Kiker, Mary Tomasetti, Mark Testori. We thank Simon Holt and Dan Stevens for bringing us our special music this morning. Bob McCracken will be our scripture reader, and our deacons, as always, are faithfully assisting us. So thank you all. So good chilly morning to everybody. We have two scripture readings this morning, both from the New Testament. The first is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, and it's verses 18 through 22. As Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. They were casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. And as he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets. And he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Our second reading is from the Gospel of John. It's chapter 1 and verses 35 through 38. The next day John again was standing with two of his disciples. And as he watched Jesus walked by, he exclaimed, look, there the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them following, he said to them, what are you looking for? 
This ends our scripture readings for this morning. Good morning, everyone. Great to be back with you this week. I'd like to begin with a quote from the late Leonard Cohen. Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. That's how the light gets in. Friends, for our pastoral pr prayer today, our response, which I hope you'll help me with, is Lord, hear our prayer. Today I'm including some prayers sent to me via email this week. So please uh, feel free to email or call us with any prayers you'd like us to include into our pastoral prayer. Loving God, as we gather today here at on the front lawn or at home, we begin with thanks. Thanks for this day, this community of grace and the embrace of love that holds us fast. Lord, hear our prayer. Loving God, Dios, Holy Mystery, Great Spirit, whatever names we use to call out to you in prayer, we offer ourselves in, in the quiet of this moment for the life of the world. However far we search, may we feel your presence through the daylight and the shadows in ever-widening circles. May we follow in the footsteps of wisdom and offer hope to one another as we go. May our challenges be born with vulnerability and with strength. And may we meet our neighbors with openness and compassion. Lord, hear our prayer. We ask that you bless our country in these days of transition, disharmony, and division. We pray especially for leaders everywhere and for those who are willing to guide with integrity, trust, and humility. We pray as well for those who are separated from their families and friends because of the pandemic, and for those who are far from home. And we pray for a time when all swords shall be turned into plowshares for the well-being of all. Lord, hear our prayer. We lift up blessings today for those recovering from illness and for many who may be weighed down by grief, illness, or pain. We pray especially today for friends undergoing surgery, for college students with COVID, and for so many others worried about whether they too might have the virus. We pray for those we know undergoing cancer treatment and for caregivers in their steadfastness. We also offer thanks for our first responders, for emergency room staff, for firefighters who come at any time of the day or night, and for physicians and nurses and the extraordinary people who serve the vulnerable no matter what. Lord, hear our prayer. We also pray for the Torres family and for other friends like Jose, Javier, and Saul and their families in Honduras and other countries who have been recently devastated by storms there. May help be on its way soon. And we also pray for those friends in our midst celebrating new babies and milestone birthdays. We are so grateful that you are in the world. Lord, hear our prayer. In this next moment, I invite you to share a moment of silence together to pray for what is deepest in our hearts. Compassionate God, lift the worries from our hearts and the struggles that we face. 
illuminate our steps as we seek you in the face of one another. Let us together work towards wholeness in our lives and in our loves. And as the poet Elizabeth Alexander would say, may we seek a love that is beyond marital, filial, national, a love that casts a widening pool of light. For all of this, we pray in the name of love. Amen. I'm up again. Well, now is the time for our offering. And I want to share with you that um, some of you, many of you may know that in India and for millions of Hindus and Sikhs and Jans all across the world, the, this is the festival of lights called Diwali. And Diwali marks the biggest celebration of their religious year. It's an auspicious occasion that symbolizes the triumph of light over darkness, goodness over evil, hope over despair. A message I think we can all share in. So as we collect our offerings today, let us do so in thanksgiving for all the ways people give thanks for goodness, life, and hope. May we all be the light for one another in this next moment. You are all a light to the ministries of our church. The offering will now be collected. Holy God, we give thanks for the gifts of light and life bestowed on all of us in this season of diminishing light. Be with us and remind us of our kinship with all that lives. In Jesus' name, with great gratitude, we pray. Amen. Well, hey out there, it's good to see all of you. I know it's chilly. I see some folks under blankets. I hope you're staying warm or as warm as you can right now. Dan, I want to say thank you for that beautiful rendition of the Reverend song. I love that song. I love that song. As long as I'm in this world, I am the light of this world. I think that can apply to you. That can apply to me. Well, this is a sermon entitled, What Are You Looking For? 
You know, some individuals and families have acquired pandemic dogs. Our family has emphatically resisted. Not because the kids haven't implored us weekly or sometimes nightly. And not because Rachel and I don't like dogs. We do. We do like dogs. Rather, it's because we have conceded as much as we wish to the strictures and the structures of domesticity. Not for us the morning and the evening walks, and not for us the shedding, and not for us the kennels every time we wish to go somewhere, not for us those little bags that you have to carry with you on every walk. We did, however, make one concession. We got a hamster, or rather, Augie got a hamster. His name is Harold. Harold is brown and white, and he lives in a small glass terrarium with a little ramp that leads up to a second level, this one made of wire. That's where Harold's food is located. Harold has a wheel that he runs on. He sleeps a lot. He buries himself in a pile of bedding. At night when I'm putting Augie to bed, Harold will often be starting his day because hamsters are apparently nocturnal. And he'll busy himself rearranging the furniture, furniture. he'll run on the wheel, and sometimes he'll climb onto those wire walls and he'll begin to gnaw at the metal, just kind of <laughs> And at first I was kind of worried about that, but Augie informed me that it's normal for hamsters to do that because they're filing their teeth, which keep on growing the way that human fingernails or toenails might grow. But I can say that the gnawing on the cage gives Harold a kind of desperate quality sometimes, as if he's determined to chew his way out of that cage, escaping from his own Shawshank prison. There are some nights that I sit there mesmerized by Harold. And I think he's pretty fascinating on his own terms, but I confess he's been transformed into something a little bit more for me. He's been transformed into a metaphor for life lived under a pandemic. I don't know about all of you, but in our house, we're all of us starting to feel as though we're trapped in our own little terrarium. We eat, we sleep, we, we uh, run on our wheel, whether at school or at work or at home. Sometimes we rearrange our domestic furniture and then we sleep and we eat and we run on the wheel and push a few more things around and it's kind of about it right now. It could be worse. It could be a lot worse. And there's much to be thankful for. But lately, the kids seem as though they're on the walls of that cage trying to gnaw their way out. Each in their own way, they've showed signs of pandemic fatigue. Rachel and I feel it too. I know a lot of people do. Deep into this pandemic, with months still to go, our lives are feeling pretty constricted. Many of us are working harder than we've ever worked before, and while we're grateful to have work at all, it's leaving us drained with little time for the things that make us human. On the flip side of that, there are others among us who have far too little to do, and a gaping emptiness is opened in our lives. Whatever our particular circumstances, if we're honest, many of us feel that we're in that glass terrarium right about now. We can see to an outside. We know it's there. 
But however we define that outside, we can't seem to get to it. Not a few of us have taken to gnawing on the bars of our cage. The pandemic, in other words, has rendered a lot of us not a little unlike Harold. Added to all of that has been the intensity and the tension of the past few weeks. I think that too has taken a toll. And so at this point, I think it's time to pull back just a little bit and to ask some more basic questions of ourselves and of one another. Things like this. How are you doing, really? How are you handling things right now? What are the parts of your life that need attention? What do you need for the coming months in order to get through it all with your sanity and your humanity intact? If everything goes well, 2021 will bring a gradual lightening of the burdens we've all been carrying. There's reason to be optimistic about many of the developments on the horizon. If you've ever driven the Pennsylvania Turnpike, I envision the way before us as something like those enormous tunnels that cut through the Allegheny Mountains. When you enter them, you can't even discern the other side. But then far off there in the distance, a small, tiny dot of sunlight appears, and it's a long, long way off. But as you drive, that dot gradually widens and enlarges until suddenly you're through it. You're in the open again. And I like to think that we're discerning that pinprick of light just now. But realistically, it is still a long ways off. We'll still have to do what it takes to get ourselves there intact and healthy. In our personal lives as well as our professional lives. And yes, here at the church as well, we'll have to keep on dodging and weaving and adapting as the need arises. I want you to hear, I want you to feel encouraged that we are getting there. The pinprick of light is discernible in the distance. But the questions remain. What do you need in order to get there? Feeling trapped in our own terrariums and gnawing the wires as some of us are, what do we, what do you need to do in order to take care of yourself, in order to take care of ourselves right now? What do we need to do to take care of one another? To answer that question, it may be helpful to consider an episode early in the Gospels in which Jesus calls his first disciples. Now, I've spoken often over the past few months about the importance of endurance, of digging deep and finding reserves of spirit and strength that we didn't know were ever there. Whether in the wilderness wanderings of the Hebrew people or in the call of, in the book of Hebrews to keep on pressing forward, there are ample passages and stories found in the Bible about pressing on in the midst of hardship. But what we find in the calling of the disciples is something entirely different. Something that we might also need right now. You see, there we find a story about leaving it all behind in order to pursue that which brings life. The stories about the calling of the disciples aren't about endurance or persistence at all. They're about making a necessary change in order to access our, their deepest, truest humanity. If we truly are gnawing at the cage right now, 
I'll put forth that perhaps those are the stories we need at this moment. Not only the ones that simply say, keep on going, keep on going. We do need to keep going, but maybe we also need to find ways to inject something different and new into our, into our passage of days. Consider the passage from Matthew. What's striking about that story, about that passage, is how quickly, how easily, the first disciples simply abandoned their work and set out for something new. It's almost as if they too had been gnawing the cage, trapped in the terrarium, waiting to get out. There's Peter and his brother Andrew fishing at the Sea of Galilee. We can imagine them doing the very same thing, more or less, from the time of their birth. And we can imagine that they might have done the same until their time on the planet was through. Until Jesus said, come on, follow me. And then there's James and John mending their nets, their fishing nets on the shore, along with their father. And we can imagine much the same for them. All it takes for them is a word. And they're off as if they've been waiting their whole lives for that particular, for that singular moment. What was it that compelled them to simply drop what they were doing and leave it all behind? Were they bored? Was it the prospect of something better? Was it a midlife crisis? Was there the possibility that whatever this stranger was up to, it answered to a profound existential need in their lives? Whatever their reasons, Peter and Andrew, James and John, they respond to the invitation. They say yes to Jesus, but also to themselves. They say yes to the world, but also to their own lives. In that instance, they don't choose persistence or endurance. They swerve, they shift, they improvise, and they leave their nets behind. In John's Gospel, the story runs a little bit differently. There, a few folks start tagging along with Jesus at a distance, attracted by something about what he was up to. They too had swerved and shifted and improvised. But this time, instead of an invitation, Jesus delivers a question. What, what are you looking for? Just sit with that question and make it your own for a while. It's meant for you just as much as it was meant for those stray followers. What are you looking for? That is a universal question asked of every single person who lives or has ever lived on this planet. What is it that you want deep down? What is it that you really, truly desire? I had a teacher in grad school who said that was the basic question of every single piece of theology. What do you desire? I wonder how many people ever ask themselves that question, let alone ponder it, let alone try to respond. After the question of a career or a decent job has been answered, what are you looking for? After the question of finding a life partner, perhaps, however that's defined, has been answered, 
What are you looking for? After the question of food and clothing and shelter and amusement have all been answered, what, what are you looking for? After you get what you think you want and you still feel like gnawing the cage, well, what then are you looking for? Jeff Gordon here is a writer who knows something about being trapped in a glass terrarium. He knows what it is to be asked what you're looking for and to set off in pursuit of that. Gordon here is a food writer whose byline has appeared in a good many national publications. On the surface, he achieved a level of success that relatively few managed to do. And for a variety of reasons, his life was unraveling. His marriage fell apart. He was separated from his children. He was living in a crummy bachelor apartment, the kind of sad place that men of a certain age inhabit after a divorce. His finances were in the tank. Whatever the magazines he wrote for, Jeff Gordon here was in the terrarium, seemingly without a way out. And it was during that time that a publishing agent called and said that a particular chef wanted to talk about a new project. Gordon here shrugged. It's like someone calling a preacher and saying that a sermon needs to be written. It happens every few days. For Gordon Neer, such a call initiated a transactional exchange. He gets a story, the chef gets a little publicity, you move on. But Gordon Neer took the assignment. The chef in question was a charismatic artist named Rene Redzepi, who is to food what Bob Dylan was to music in the 1960s or what David Bowie was to music in the 1970s, an innovator who changes the entire field of discourse around him. And something clicked between the two of them. It wasn't long after that that Gordon Neer got a text message on his phone. Red Zeppi was offering a reservation for two at his restaurant in Copenhagen, something fairly impossible to come by. The invitation came with a hitch, however. It was only 48 hours away. There was the question of money. There was the question of time. There was the question of the obligations he would have to renege on. There was the question of responsibility. There was the question of steadiness and duty. Would he stay? Or would he swerve? What was it he was looking for? Pause there for just a second. Because I'm curious what you would do. Imagine that a friend or an acquaintance asked you to step out of your ordinary routine, to do something unusual on a whim. Would you just keep on mending your nets? Or would you have a hair appointment to keep? Would you have a work assignment due? Would you decline simply because it was out of character? Or would you perhaps say yes? Look, there's something noble in being the one who's dependable and steady, and there's something undeniably good about being one who does what needs to be done. I thank God for those qualities in people. But I will also tell you that I worry sometimes that in all that steadiness and in all that dependability, I worry that we allow our Jesus moments to pass us by. 
I worry that we decline those moments that wind up opening us, broadening us, getting us out of the terrarium that we have been staring out of. I wish to know if you received that call. How would you respond? You probably won't be surprised to know that Jeff Gordon here said yes. It wound up changing his life. Saying yes is what started to pull him out of his malaise. Saying yes is what led to a new friendship. Saying yes is what led to a series of questions about the origins of creativity and inspiration in one's life and work. Saying yes is what led him to write a travelogue book called Hungry. Jeff Gordon here wound up saying yes, and it freed him from the terrain he was living in. After so much gnawing, the steel wires finally gave, and he was out. So, okay, there are some reasons that story might not go over well right now. Even in his malaise, Gordon Ear was and is privileged in ways that few of us are. Even in the best of times, very few among us are ever invited to drop what we're doing and head off to Copenhagen. And then a pandemic, a tale like that, might be something like showing a picture of bread to someone who's starving. It may be cruel because it's unattainable. Not only that, as one person I talked to this week put it, I'm filled with a special kind of dread in being told to say yes to one more thing. What this person said was that I need to say no to extra things. I need to say no to those opportunities that might change my life because they might all change my life and none of them do. Touche. Yes, indeed. Our circumstances are different. And there are all sorts of things that we need to say no to right now, out of necessity. Play dates, holiday travel, gatherings with friends, dinners out. There are things we probably do need to say no to right now for our own good and for the good of those around us. But given those constraints, what is it we need to say yes to? What are the obligations we need to let go of, at least temporarily, in order to say yes to our sanity? What's the swerve or the departure or the improvisation that we could introduce even under the constraints that we face? What is it that we're looking for now that would allow us to get through the remainder of this pandemic with our lives intact and whole? I think to judge by the stories from the Gospels, and from Jeff Gordon era alike, it's human connection first and foremost. It's friendship. It's companionship. It's the kind of energy and creativity that can arise when we are in touch with other people that we love. That's why even though it feels repetitive at this point, it's so important to keep on making the phone calls to people that you love and to keep on having those Zoom conversations, those Zoom happy hours with those that you miss and to keep on reaching out to those who might be feeling adrift, they might need it more than you. 
We'll continue to do that around here as we've done all along. I want this community to be one in which people feel known and loved and cared for. Even if other connections are hard to come by these days, I want this to be a community that you can fall back upon. A community of grace and acceptance and trust. I think most of all, we just need to keep on reaching out and finding ways to keep the relationships in our lives strong. Here's something else the stories indicate. It's a yearning for difference, for variety, for the swerve. And so let me say in the most pastoral way possible that if you are feeling overwhelmed right now, find a way to take a break. In the name of your humanity and of your health, give yourself a break. Don't go into work one day or maybe two. Let the kids take a day off. Order out. Eat well. Try a new recipe. Take a drive to a part of the state that you've never visited before. Read a book you've always meant to read. Walk in a place you don't typically walk. Be a little less prepared if you need to be. Do what you need to do in order to take care of yourself, in order to honor yourself, in order to love yourself. If you're very lucky, there will be people around you that will help you to do that. But right now, let's assume you've got to stand up for you and claim that self-care for yourself. Even if only for a time. My humble pastoral suggestion is to leave off mending the nets just for a little bit. And to say yes to whatever it is that you need in this particular moment. I think we can do that while still remaining mindful of the need for caution. Limited though we are, there are still ways that we can say yes to our lives. Now, I know there's going to be resistance. It might come from those around you who don't wish to give that kind of freedom. And it might come from the little voices inside of you, voices telling you to stay the course and keep in your rut and to stay in your terrarium. I know all about that. Not long ago, I shared with my kids that I felt we were becoming a little bit like Harold. I told them that I didn't quite know what we could do about that except to interrupt our habits just a tiny bit. The best I could think of in the moment was to suggest a hike in the woods to a beautiful promontory, something challenging but doable. I wish to tell you that the voices of resistance in our household were fierce. It was easier and evidently better to just keep on doing what we were doing, staring at our screens, playing video games, watching movies, all that stuff. standing before you to tell you that it took an enormous amount of cajoling and persuasion to achieve even that tiny swerve. I'm also here to tell you that it didn't go especially well. One of the kids developed a sore foot. 
Another didn't want to hike all the way to the lookout, even though it wasn't that far. And so we improvised. Instead of climbing to the lookout, we found a remote meadow. And we sat there for a little bit, noticing what was around us. And then we found another meadow with a cluster of pine trees scattered about. And it reminded the kids of something a little bit haunted or a little bit magical. And a short time after that, we circled back to the van. It had taken a lot even to do that. But then on the way home, one of them said, almost in a whisper, kind of quietly, kind of sheepishly, I kind of liked that. <laughs> Friends, the bell's ringing. We still have a long way to go in this pandemic. But remember Harold the hamster? And when you're feeling trapped in the terrarium, find a way to yield to the swerve. Take care of yourself. Trust that some little voice inside of you, when you do yield to the swerve, will say, I kind of liked that. And then remember to lean on one another to lean on one another when you're not feeling strong. Amen.
We all need somebody to leave. You just might have a problem. Understand? We all need somebody to leave. And if there is a load you have to bear that you can't carry. not strong I'll be your friend I'll help you carry on it won't be long I'm gonna need somebody to lean on it won't be long I'm gonna need Somebody to leave Thanks, Brother Dan. It's true, it may not be long till we all need someone to lean on. Truth be told, we already do. We always do. We have each other. We've got each other to lean on. And we'll keep on leaning on one another throughout this endeavor that we're on right now. For now, though, go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak and help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you today and forevermore. Amen, and go in peace.